This episode is brought to you by the Golden State Film Festival. Now, the final date to submit your film, short or screenplay, is March 15th. Check them out and submit on Film Freeway. All right, let's get into the room. Hey, Sam, you come up with that intro line? You didn't tell me that was today. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Writer's Room with Sam and Jim. This is the show where we bring aspiring writers into our writer's room to help them work on and develop their stories, usually. This week, though, we've got a special guest. We're going to break story with a friend of ours from Daredevil, a woman we love to death, Tamara Becker-Wilkinson. But first, we have an announcement. We're going to be doing a live podcast at South by Southwest, sponsored by Blue Jeans by Verizon. Our set is on Thursday, March 18th at 1 p.m. Pacific, and you can watch it live on YouTube. That link will be on our Twitter and Instagram, at the Sam and Jim. Okay, I can tell Sam is raring to go off. Sam, what do you got? All right, so here's what I was thinking about. I was remembering at the times when we would work a full day in the restaurant, and then we would go back to my place at night, <laughs> and we would sit there and try to write. Yeah. And I know there's a lot of people, some of whom, like six, who are listening to this show. <laughs> <laughs> You're dreaming. You think six people are listening to this? <laughs> and they... Our work, they're out there and they're working jobs and then they have to go and they want to sit down and do what they really want to do, which is write, and they have to do it. Or it's a Saturday and they've got, they haven't written all week and they need to cram it into one Saturday and they're tired and they wish they could be doing the writing, but then they finally get there and it's not showing up. And how many times did that happen to us? And it's the best thing about having a writing partner because <laughs> you have someone waiting for those pages, right? Yeah, that helps a lot. It helps. They're, they're looking at you. And also, you, you know, you, can, you can't at the last second say, I'm going to go see a movie. Or, or you, get a, you get a text and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I can help you with that thing because you really, now you're helping your friend instead of writing. But there are a lot of people in that situation. And I was thinking about, yes, the writing partner definitely helps. But the thing that worked for me the most was that I approached it like a job. Yeah. And I think you did too, which is it wasn't about having fun. And I, th I don't know why that was okay back then. Uh, I don't know why that worked for us, but I don't think there was any other way that we could approach it. Yeah. Right? I don't know. I, I, I feel like it was something we both wanted, you know, we were both English majors in college, mm -hmm. I guess, cause we always took it seriously that we, we thought we could actually pull it off if we worked at it. Yeah. And I think the thing that, that, that made it fun for us was we had a limited amount of time. And yeah. I think that's what, when we write now, we have a limited amount of time because you got to get the script in, the outline, you got to have something to pitch to the showrunner by the end of the day, or you have to have the, the you have to have all your notes on the cut done by three o'clock. Or it's going into production on Tuesday and right. now it's Wednesday and they need a script. Or you're on the set and, uh, you know, the, the AD comes over and says, we're running late. Well, well can you cut something out of the scene <laughs> that we're shooting in three hours. And you're like, what? <laughs> I, well, I was on set producing the, the final episode of Daredevil episode 13. And we're in the middle of shooting a two day fight sequence. And it's, it was about uh, 10 PM at night on a Friday. And we were due to shoot till about two in the morning that night. And people came over to me to say, we're not going to make it. Like yeah. we don't have enough time. We need to lose a whole chunk of this fight sequence now before we're into the last day of shooting. Otherwise we're not going to be able to, to fit it all together. And, uh, and there was pushback from various people to do it, but that was my job. I had to go, go over and, then, and cut an entire section out of the fight sequence that was planned and people had practiced for for a week and, and all that stuff. And little did you know that the skill that you were de we were developing in my attic or your attic or the coffee shop, wherever we would go, where this is a, we have to get done by this amount of time because we have to go to work. Right. Yeah. Um, that same skill showed up on the set of Daredevil in the finale season three years later, because it's the same thing. It's a job. We sit down and you do it. And if it sucks, you still do it. And if it doesn't suck, you're happy for that day until the next day when you realize, no, it really did suck, but you didn't realize it at the time. Or the, those moments where you go back and you're like, oh my God, I did that. And whatever it is, you just show up the next day. And you do it again. And that was the best part about that that edit to that fight scene is you'd never know it wasn't there. It worked out great. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter in the long run, and we got it through the whole uh, Just keep telling sequence. yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Tell, about that. So, all right. So that's the good news of having a real job and what it forced us to do. Okay. Let's get into this week's show. 
Hello, Tamara. Hello. Yay, Tamara's here. Yay. Hi, Tamara. Hi. So we are super excited to have you, not just because you're our first writer, professional writer that we've had on this show, but also we have spent many, many hours uh, bullshitting in the Daredevil writer's room. So we know how to be together. And this might go smoothly. Or it could be a disaster. We'll find out. And <laughs> I want to brag for a second about your all your credits because they're great. They're beautiful. And it, it almost it makes you look like a grown-up professional writer, which, like all my friends, I can't believe any of us are grown-up professional writers. <laughs> but uh, you worked on Runaways and Warehouse 13 and Covert Affairs and Iron Fist and Daredevil, of course, and Doom Patrol. And now you're on, is it season two of Doom Patrol or three? Three. Oh my Already on God. three, but they haven't aired two yeah. yet. Is that right? No, it no, it um, it came out in earlier in the year. Thank you for checking it out, Sam. I appreciate. <laughs> it. I, wa- I, I watched the first season. Thanks for I tuning did. in, pal. I know. By the way, I, it's always embarrassing because there is so much television, and no. It, so I don't know if that's a good thing because now there's an excuse. Be like, you know, I only watch The Crown over and over. Um, yeah. <laughs> or, and Big Mouth. Yeah, and Big Mouth. Oh, yeah. Um, peak TV. I actually started watching House. I watched, it's Peak TV. Peak TV. Right. Yeah. I watched House and You MD. take a peek and then you go on to something else. Well, that's true, too. Yeah. <laughs> Don't encourage him to me. Um, well, all right. Let me ask you a question, which is a question that I know I ask myself all the time. But there are fewer working writers than there are players in the NBA. Why the hell? Did you try to do this job? Well, I'm very flattered that you think there are many of jobs that I could do <laughs> other than this. Um, I was blissfully unaware of that statistic, that um, of the difficulty, you know, and how few jobs there were, especially at the time when I started, because there weren't all these streaming networks um, and cable channels. I don't know. I just, I, I guess I just loved uh, movies and TV so much that the thought of getting to do that as a job and getting to basically watch TV and read comic books as a job right. just pushed all sort of doubt and deterrence out of my head. And I just sort of decided when I moved to Los Angeles that I'm not leaving until it happens. So did you move out here for to be a writer? I did. So you had to pack up all your stuff. Did you have to tell anybody that you were doing this and then look at their faces? <laughs> <laughs> Especially maybe your parents. <laughs> well, thankfully, I was very fortunate that I had really supportive parents. And my they were are both also lovers of movies and TV. And um, my father had told me that his grand that his father, my grandfather, had always thought that being a writer was one of the best things that you can be. Mm. Um, I don't know why wow. he felt that way, but he did. And so when I told him that's what I wanted to do, and that and now that's what I'm doing, that he's just enormously proud of that. That's fantastic. Yeah, that is. That's, yeah, and not all that usual. Although I don't know that it's unusual, but I know when I told my mother, she got instantly very worried. And is still worried to this day. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. a steady paycheck thing, right? Yeah, it's like, a, she just wants to know that I have a steady source of income to support my family. And, of course, for years I didn't. So she was right. Not right, but her, her worst fear came true, which is I spent years where I was living on my wife's part-time teacher check, which I don't wish on anybody, oh especially teachers. And uh, so it's hard on the families, and it's hard on the friends. Um, but, uh, but you yeah. know, uh, as as Jewish parents, you know, like nothing gives them more. Well, I don't know. Maybe a, a you know, like seeing a doctor certificate may have given them more joy. But <laughs> when they get to see their child's name on the screen, you know, like that's just the it's it's bliss. Vindication. Wow. It is. Although yeah, I'm not sure my parents really watch most of the shows that I do. Yeah. And I, oh, yeah, uh, <laughs> mine don't either. <laughs> <laughs> they do get to see that moment. There's no question. Um, I think I'll tell you the the last thing of mine that my parents watched that I can remember um, was a Shades of Blue episode where at the end someone finds out Ray Liotta's secret that spoiler alert that he's a closeted gay man mm-hmm. and this guy threatens to tell his secret and so Ray Liotta silences him by having another guy 
uh, rape that guy. And that is, the, I think, the last thing of mine that my parents watched. <laughs> but why? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> okay, wow. that That's a perfect lead into something we want to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good segue. <laughs> So, so we were thinking about what to talk about with professional writers, and we thought we'd play a game called High Low, which is when you think about your career and all the stuff you've gone through to get from from moving out here to where you are now. Um, we want to talk about a high point and a low point, and we want to start with the low point. Like, what what was your low point in in trying to get here, or even once you were here? Like, what's a moment where you thought, "Why the blank did I do this? Why did I do this to myself?" Because we all have well, them. the first, yeah. I mean, there's definitely there's tons. I mean, just in life, tons of highs and low. But one thing that always stands out to me is I. It took me a long time to get my. I think I was like 33 when I got my first staff job, and um, so I felt like I was. And there wasn't a ton of social media at the time, so I wasn't able to like connect with writer Twitter and see how common it was that you know that. Uh, that your first staff job comes at the spectrum of ages and there's nothing abnormal about being 33 or 43 when mm-hmm. you get your first job. But um, it took me a long time to to get that first job and I was so excited to have it, but I had never really, I'd been a script coordinator. And so I hadn't been in the writer's room a ton. I'd been right outside the writer's room a oh, ton. That's almost but, worse. Um, almost yeah, worse. Right, right there. Right you can almost touch yeah. it. <laughs> now, I yeah. just want to take a break and say that it's, for anybody who doesn't know, script coordinator is the person that not only proofs all the scripts, but then publishes them to all the different departments that need to the executive executives to the, to the line producer. Everybody gets your work. Keeps so, track of all the revisions. I mean, this is a, this is a very complicated, intricate job, but also you are right next to the dream and you're reading all the drafts. I want to hear about the low point, but it must've been hard to be like, Oh, I could write this. I know I could write this. <laughs> did that, did that happen? Yeah. Uh, not a ton on while I was script coordinating, but when I was a reader at DreamWorks for a couple of years, that happened a ton. I was mm-hmm. like, if they're looking at this stuff, they yeah. should be looking at my stuff. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm at least as bad as this guy. Right. <laughs> How are these people in and I'm still out? I don't get it. Exactly. Exactly. So I remember getting my first job on Warehouse 13 and after a week of being in the writer's room, and it was a big writer's room, it was like 12 or 13 people wow. for, I don't know, 10 episodes or 15 episodes. It was big. Um, there was only one other woman in it. So it was like this big gang of loud men and me and this other woman. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it was just so, it was not at all what I expected. I don't know what I expected, but it was hard and it was draining. And I remember my parents coming to visit for Thanksgiving and uh, debating whether or not to tell them, you know, I don't know if I made the right decision. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do this. Why, why were you, you finally got there? What, what, yeah. what, what happened in that week or two on that job that you were, so you were second guessing everything? Yeah, I think I just, I put so much pressure on myself mm-hmm. to, I wanted to be, uh, I, I guess I needed, I had gotten there and that should have been the validation that I belonged there or that I deserved to be there. But I guess I felt like every day I need to prove that I deserve to be there, yeah, right. you know? Yeah. And so if I didn't get a point on the board during the day or if right. my, I kept getting stuff shut down cause I was, I've never been shy about speaking up in a writer's room um, ever. We know that yeah. to be true. And so <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if I came home and I, all of my pitches had been shot down or, you know, or that it just, it really would hit me really hard. And now, but it also that it wasn't easy to come up with those pitches either, you right. know? Mm-hmm. And so what I, in hindsight, now I know it's like a muscle that you develop, you know, and then right. your brain will sort of wire those neurons to, to help you. Mm-hmm. But um, I just, uh, I, I wish I'd been a little more relaxed and enjoyed it more because it was such a fun show to work on. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you know, you know, it's funny to me about that. Uh, looking on this side, I, I completely know what you're saying. And, yep. and we got really good advice on our first show, which is don't say anything for two weeks. Just don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so as little as possible, just sit there and, and figure out how things work. Right. And I remember sitting there thinking, first of all, oh, my God, these writers, 
you know, these senior writers were so fast and they, they knew the blind alleys and they had a shorthand and they were just ping-ponging back and forth and it was magic to me. And Jim and I have been writing for a number of years at this point and we were used to doing that with each other, but they were actually good at it. <laughs> and, and, they, and they knew so much. But also, uh, just being quiet let me just sort of sit back and, and watch. The other thing is now that we're senior writers, now... I expect so little from staff writers. Um, and I wish I could say, I say that to, I try to say that to them, which is, it never doesn't sound correct. He says, I don't expect very much from you, but I want to <laughs> say, don't you feel this, this way this, though, Tamara? It's training, right? It's training. Like this is the beginning we, we, where no one's expecting you to come up with that pitch every single day, you know? Well, it's always like, I, I guess I, I had never thought about it that way, but now that you sort of put words to it in a sense, I guess, yes, because like, when a new guy comes into the room and they're quiet for a while and they really choose their pitch carefully and then they pitch it and it's awesome. You're like, wow, I did not, who was this guy? I did not right. expect that. So, mm -hmm. 100%. And, and the thing I think yeah. that uh, newer writers can do is when they hear a pitch from someone uh, that's, that's experienced is to help build it. You know, mm -hmm. that's a huge skill. To just be like, oh, if we do that, how about this? And then build, build. It doesn't have to be a completely original script. It can be an add-on because that's that's the that's what we all do for each other. Um, ideally. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh, that's that sounds. I'm full of anxiety now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thinking of you coming uh, home with that week, but that, all that all sorted out just fine, though, right? Oh yeah, that was um, uh, on that show. That was a while ago. Yeah, that was a while <laughs> yeah. ago. Yeah. So you've been. Okay. I mean, look, but we all know the like the truth is that there's always a degree of that anxiety, and I feel like most writers, when they drive home, when they used to drive home from work, that you're always doing a post mortem in your head of, oh God, why did I say that? Or oh, this was a good idea. Why didn't why I didn't get traction? Or you know, you're always beating yourself up a little bit, but it just makes me want to come back the next day and, and you know, do my job well. You know, I got to say, I don't do that. You don't? I never do that. No, I, uh, I can't, I don't shut off the brain. I mean, I'm always, you know, we all do that. We're just thinking and, and then, you know, you get into those uncomfortable moments with your wife. <laughs> where, where she's been talking for five minutes and you haven't heard a thing because you you just you think you just found out found the the answer to that problem you were dealing with at three thirty in the afternoon when your brain was dead, right? But I I don't I don't get in. That's not my that's not my uh, I have my other anxieties. But is that Jim? Do you do that? I I don't anymore. I feel mm -hmm. like I did for a while, but mm -hmm. then um you know now it feels like every idea it's all just tinder. Right, yeah. you're just throwing stuff out, and some of it works, some of it doesn't, and 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 move on. Yeah, um, but I guess we all, you know, everyone approaches this thing. It's incredibly uh, awkward, and we all know that to sit in front of a people, a room of people you don't know, and say, "This is what I think is good," <laughs> this yeah. is and then everyone says, "No, it's not." No, it's not because it <laughs> right, um, and and even if they don't say that, you feel like they're saying that, right? You know. Uh, well, that's the, the one of the harder things about being in a Zoom room right now is that when you're after you pitch, I mean, when your pitch doesn't land and there's silence, it hits oh. nine times as hard as it does so when brutal. you're in person. Oh. I try yeah. to I try to nod loud, nod loudly. <laughs> <laughs> so be like, yes, I'm with you. I'm putting up my hand, thumbs up, all that kind of stuff to to uh, be encouraging. But it's hard, you know. Um, yeah. So okay, having touched the lows. What's a high? Like what? 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 What feels great that has happened to you so far? What's a crowning achievement? Oh, being on this um, podcast. Yeah, besides being this on the podcast, definitely. <laughs> it was. It was too obvious, so I didn't want to just yeah. say. That, you know, mm -hmm. sure as it might be. Um, I mean, there's there's so many highs uh, that I'm trying to think of. You know, I mean, what's always a really great moment. I mean, with every single job is just getting the phone call to say you got an offer. Yeah. And it's the same feeling every single time mm -hmm. of just, yeah, it, it, that's, it's, there's nothing better. You know, it's funny that you say, is, is that because it's validation? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't yeah, want to get all a thousand, a thousand percent because yeah. part of it too, is when you think about it, you get the showrunner meeting because they liked your writing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So right. you're now you're sitting in the room with a person and now it's about what I'm thinking about after I leave the office is okay. Either they liked me or they didn't like, it. and as much as you want to say it's not personal, it's sort of is personal. 
Right. Um, but there, I mean, there's also so many factors like, do I fit into their budget and right. do I fit into their dynamic, their room dynamic right. and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's a hundred percent, it's validation, but it's also like, yes, I know where my next few paychecks are coming right, from. Right. Validation month. plus rent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Equals happiness. Yes, it does. Yeah. Uh, that It's true. That validation is key. And, and the thing is, I know what, because I, I've been on both sides of this being, uh, you know, I've helped pick rooms or picked rooms. And then, you know, we've been up for jobs and I know how utterly random it is. And there are so many mm. factors and it changes every and, hour. And so many things you don't even consider, right? right? Like, oh, wait, we have to throw a bone to the studio executive who really wants this person or someone off of this list, even though you'd rather have a different person that you interviewed than was necessarily on that list. Right. Or, <clears throat> And what sucks about that is you can't call them and tell them that. Right. <laughs> and say, uh, this isn't you. Yeah. This is politics. Some, I'm sure that the agents do that, you know, and I'm sure they're like, oh, well, they don't want to hire th this person. They want to hire that. You know, there's there's always that protecting. I also also feel like I, what I get, what excites me is when someone has picked us and now we're in the writer's room and I know how much of what they are going to do relies on us. And I know, you know, because they, this is their show. The showrunner has worked so hard to get to this point and get this show going. And now here's the room, and they picked us to do it. And I, that is exciting to me because now I'm like, all right, we're going to do this now. That's how I feel about it. I feel like we're going to do this. Um, and and it, it, I, I don't get afraid well, yeah, in that moment. That's I get a really excitement. good way to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, plus, if it all blows up, oh, well, it's television. <laughs> <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's true, though. You know, seven, eight, nine, ten months later, okay, moving on. Yeah. I mean, we the thing yeah. is for the thing for us though is for us to do our job well, we have to invest, right? And the problem with investing is it's like putting your hand on the rail, you know, on the train track. You know that train's coming, but if you you have to put your hand on there cuz and then you're going to pitch it out or you're going to write the script and someone is not going to like it. It's a guarantee. I, I think that metaphor is a low point for me. <laughs> <laughs> I retract the metaphor, but I stand by the idea of risk and I'm backing you up uh Tamara. All right, so now, um, so Jr. Now, I just want to say this, Tamara, we have not heard the idea yeah. that Jr. is about to pitch. So it's all three of us, professional writers that we have somehow conned. We, we've been picked, we've been hired, we've been put in the room. <laughs> this is our room, <laughs> <laughs> and he's going to give us this idea, and we have never heard it. So now everyone can hear us fall flat on our faces as we try to take this idea. And maybe spin it out into a TV show so people could see how, how we might attack an idea in a room or just when we're by ourselves and we're thinking, Does this, is this is an idea that has legs? Can we make this into a show? Okay. Okay. I'm excited. All right. Here we go. All right. Living in an isolated agrarian society in the early 1960s, a 16-year-old boy prepares for marriage on his 17th birthday. He begins to question the ways of his society when he receives a rocket propulsion textbook from a mysterious source who he believes to be his uncle, a man who has been dead for 15 years. <laughs> wow. Did you say 1860s? 1960s. 1960s. That's better. 1860s, though, would be good. Rocket what? propulsion textbooks? I, I thought it was supernatural. Yeah. That's what I thought was happening. Well, it could still be. It wow. could still be. He's been dead for 15 years. How it's did like he get in the book? Right. So what's the October first thing, Tamara? What do you think about guy meet yeah um well i think about the boy first and you know like who he is and what he what is his life like and, and then how does receiving this and where he thinks he's headed and then how does receiving this textbook uh, completely upset that right and, and and why did his uncle send him the textbook right he must have thought it would be received right in some and, way right? yeah and why him why him yeah yeah that there's something about him that he, but I don't know. Cause my mind immediately goes to is the uncle like from the future. And so he's basically setting in path. Mm -hmm. I mean, setting in motion, something that needs to happen for the uncle. So the thing I, the, future. Uh, the thing I, I ask myself, yeah. I ask myself, why is this the worst thing that could ever happen to this guy, to this kid? Not the best thing. Cause to me, the, Oh, yeah, go ahead. Because he's allergic to rocket propulsion textbooks. <laughs> <laughs> Lethally. I think he was, I think this kid was in love with the woman he was about to marry, 
right? Like it was all, he was settled into a life. He could see his future and it was all going to be fine. And this knocks it all sideways. He's six. I thought he was 16. How old is this kid? He was, he was about to get married though. Oh, he's, gonna, he's about to get married. Yeah. So this knocks it sideways right. because it threatens the thing that was most valuable right. to and him. And suddenly everything that he valued that in his life right. is less. Right. That's good. I like that. Okay, but who in the 60s, I guess there's like kind of two kinds of youngsters in the 60s that like they were that because it's like, you know, free love and who's getting married. And I guess the answer to that is like people like my parents who were not, they right. weren't part of the, you know, the counterculture. They were just part of the culture. Right. My parents too. Um, yeah. 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 It, it, it's funny. We're, we've been working on a project that's set in 1970 and we talk about the 60s a lot and like that free love thing. It's what made all the headlines. But that's not really what was happening in most of the country. Like, you know, most people were, were being dragged very slowly into the 1970s during the 60s. Like, they, they weren't there yet. So I, I think the thing— really? I, So, you know, we weren't driving down the streets and people were just, like, banging on the sidewalks, <laughs> on the bus benches. With, with the long hair in their armpits, waving in the wind. Yeah. Um, God, that's a beautiful— I, think that's a, I feel like that's a different show. <laughs> I just feel like so now, right, but so this is like you could set this in like North Dakota or something, right? Isolated agricultural, it's some I, middle of Iowa somewhere, you know. Well, I think the the thing I think you hit on it though, and this is this is a good question is, you know, there's going to be a bunch of good ideas, but if the central conflict is this is a conservative guy, or at least a guy who up until this point lives somewhere like say North Dakota, and he is. You know, going down, he's going to get married and he's going to go do a regular job and a regular thing. He gets this book and it, it calls to him and it throws his entire life into question. Is it a fish out of water kind of thing where now he goes to Caltech or to, you know, to Jet Propulsion Lab? I don't know if they existed then, Jet Propulsion Lab, but they did. But Caltech did. And that's where they were doing a lot of work. And now he's a North Dakota kid in California in the 60s. And now I understand the conflict of the worlds. What do you think? Or that's. One option. I think How terrible is that? Season oh, yeah. two, maybe. Season, see that. season I, two. There is no season two. We're just worried oh, about season two. Well, that's, I, I guess what I'm thinking is... <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you play so, season seven while we're at it? Here's the big twist in episode 400. For me, the, the, the big question that's baked into the premise is, what's up with the uncle? Like, where did this come from? Why does this speak to him? What was his relationship with his uncle that this thing should show up? I mean, if his uncle's been dead for 15 years, he never knew him. He would have been like one year old. So there's no relationship with this uncle. There's oh. just some myth of who this uncle was. Uh. So where did it come from? And how did it get here? And what, what does it point. lead him into? What do you think, Tamara? My brain is just, I think, trimmed by a human, like Harry Potter type scenario. You mm-hmm. know, there's some prophecy of something. Right. You know, that's where it just immediately goes to, that he knows something. Or at least either that or uh, the uncle... For whatever reason, I mean, let's say that uh, his brother is the father of this boy and they've been estranged, you know, or maybe this uncle is actually the kid's father, yeah. which is a thing you could find out, but sort of seems obvious. Mm-hmm. Um, but that he's been watching this kid's life from afar and recognizes himself in this boy, whether he was very bright and is stuck in this town and doesn't want to see his potential wasted on you know, being a farmer, which nothing wrong with being a farmer, you know, that's a, a great thing to be. But um, if you have a, uh, perhaps this kid has a great scientific mind and uh, just hasn't been exposed to the right things. And so the uncle, this is his way of sort of saving the boy. Yeah. I, I went to some like Operation Paperclip kind of thing where the, you know, this ah. uncle, right? Like he's some, you know, former Nazi rock and scientist or whatever it is, but in some way he's deep in secret government work at Area 51 or, you know, whatever the hell it is. And I like what I like about the idea of him actually being the boy's father is there's reason for him to think that the kid might have the same sort of scientific potential that he did. Hmm. Oh, that's cool. But that's that's all. Now, my only concern there is, let me explain to you why it's a terrible idea. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's what you do all day, Sam. I'm used to it. (laughs) <laughs> no, it's not, it's it's not it's not a terrible idea, but it's a whole different show because this is this is something that we talk about all the time, which is okay. We can dive into backstory as much as we want. The question is how what what front story is that going to lead to? So if the yeah. uncle is that guy, now I'm starting to feel like okay, that's it, that's how he got the knowledge and that's how it came to him. But is this is there is there a spy government element to it? Is there a is there an evil aspect to it? Is it is the kid of an unwitting pawn? What 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 are, what's happening there? 
right? Coming out of that backstory, which is fine. That's a story by itself. But the thing that Tamara said that I, I was interested in is it's this idea of it's just him. It's about the boy, not the uncle. So it's about being conventional, and you could go straight drama, right, which is just he's conventional his whole life, and this is his ticket out of conventional behavior, and he goes to Caltech or he goes to MIT or wherever it is, and he embarks on a new career, on a new path that basically causes him to lose or almost lose everything that he used to be and leaves him vulnerable and, and naked to the world, but also lets him realize who he actually is, right? His well, I feel like you can actually almost maybe even combo those two ideas because if he goes to Caltech or whatever and then eventually discovers the, the secret origin story of his uncle, who is a Nazi scientist oh, or whatever that, ah. that uh, they brought here, and then that sort of upsets a lot about who he thought his about his own lineage and who he thought he was and you know he he has to reconcile with that and how does that affect how he looks at the world now yeah i guess that's what that's what i go to first Uh, that's why i was saying caltech season two is i I just i want to see his world taken apart like in a pilot i would want to see his world and all the reasons he's bought into it and and this woman that he's going to marry and and all that stuff right We're, we're establishing what his world is before we take it away. And then when we're taking it away, it's the arrival of this book from someone who's supposed to be dead, which, which that's the mystery in the pilot to me. Right. Um, and then it's, it's how do you want to follow that mystery? And, and is it a slow unfolding of him realizing his interest in this book and that that dissolves his life? You know, I think what's really interesting about it, what you're saying is, is the idea. I like Tamara's idea that that's the twist, Right. That's the twist that we're going to look, work for the whole time. That, I, I, that as a writer, I'm like, holy crap. So you get this guy completely invested in, oh, my God, this is, this is taking apart my world. It's really interesting for the audience. Like, oh, he's, he's, he's becoming a different person in North Dakota. And then twist one is Caltech. We're going to go there. And then twist two is, holy shit, the guy who gave me this book is actually either my father or whatever, and there's some other agenda at work. So we're peeling back the layers. And, and what I like about it, that version is we are, we are basically peeling back the onion and taking our time with it. Instead of, right. if, it was, it, if it was older television, I think, and we didn't have the room, or if it wasn't streaming or, I, or someplace, you would have to get to that, the twist in the pilot. And yeah. now, and now maybe you don't have to. Maybe you can take time. Whether it's season two, as Jim said, or I would more front load it and make it more, you know, over course of ten episodes of season one. What do you think, Tamara? I, I, you you like my I, version better, right? My version, right? Uh, right. Well, I'll tell you this: <laughs> I love a premise pilot. Uh-huh. Uh huh. First of all, mm-hmm. uh, so I like that. I like a slower storytelling, and I like seeing spending a long time in the the main character's world as it is and then flipping it at the end and what i also think is really interesting is that you know like i feel like you know that both of your ideas together work really well uh so i guess i'm saying i like my idea the best Mm -hmm. and uh that (laughs) that what i also like is that it came from uh like jim and i thinking about the same premise in two di- but uh, coming at it from two different places. So I started thinking about the boy, and Jim started thinking about the uncle. Mm-hmm. But from that, right. you know, we got to sort of something that it started to become complex and interesting. And, and what yeah. I like about it is they're all they're both problems for each other because really television is just a series of problems. So the boy doesn't have any problems. He's getting married. It's it's he's in North Dakota. He loves North Dakota. He hates the sun and warm weather (laughs) and sunshine and fresh vegetables. So he loves North Dakota. Who needs soft hands? (laughs) And and then the book arrives, and it upends everything. And it's a problem for him. It's also a gift, but it's a problem. And then, so he's a problem. And then it turns out the book is not the problem. The uncle is the, the problem. Right. Alter- right. I mean, first it's the book, and then that cracks open the world, and then oh my God, there's a price on that book that's beyond all of this, which is there's an agenda, and what I don't know what that is, whether it's 
yeah, well, government or supernatural or pick your thing. And, and just the getting of the book could be interesting. You know, I've been listening. I've been uh, uh, listening to the audio book of Richard Rhodes, uh, "The Making of the Atomic Bomb," right? And some of oh. these scientists, you know, turn of the twentieth century, you know, nineteen twenties, whatever. These are people who would like. They would get a book like that. They would some physics book. They just pick up off the shelf and read it and get it. And there'd be like notations in the margins where they're correcting the person who wrote the textbook, even though they've never read a physics book before, because that's how their brains work. And you're right? saying this kid is like that. I, it's an option. Well, right? It makes if, him special. Right. He gets this book. Like, it doesn't matter if the books are out. The only thing that matters about that book is the uncle giving it to him unless he opens the book and it makes sense to him. Mm. Right. And he reads right. it and it's just like, oh, shit. Right. And that, that gives him that pull to want to go to Caltech, not just the Mr. The Uncle, but that there's this whole world inside of himself that he never knew about. Uh, well, there's also, I mean, there's another uh, way to take this, which is the book, you know, at first blush just seems to be about physics, but uh, it's not. And either there's a code in there that has to do with something completely unrelated, or there's something hidden in the book that, uh, you know, he wants to keep safe with the boy. Mm -hmm. or uh, a code that only the boy can solve or that kind of thing that sends him down a whole other enemy of the state kind of sure. rabbit hole. And that's the big twist. Yeah. But I think what, yeah. I, what, what yeah, I think that's cool. And, and but I like that to go back to that idea that Jim was just talking about, about the idea that this kid is special in some way. He may not know it, right? It's, you know, there's definitely the Harry Potter element of it, but it's it's nobody else necessarily knew any either except for the uncle for some reason, which is a question that we would have to answer at some point. Which is where you know you you go Terminator and there's a time travel element, right? Mm. Oh yeah, you you can flip the script on that too. And the uncle sent it to him because he thought the kid was a moron and would never figure it out. And he just <laughs> happened to him, <laughs> he underestimated him. <laughs> that's funny, and that's actually that's one of the. Benefit. That's one of the strengths of Doom Patrol, actually, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. Which is exactly. that, yeah. that 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 that, ele that humor element to it, and that's a tone, and that's something also that we, you know, I, I, we all think about when we're breaking a story. What's the tone of the show? Right. right? Oh yeah. Right, and uh, and so the idea, you know, we first of all, you talked about premise pilot a minute ago. Let's just define that. So, a premise pilot is well, a demonstration pilot. Right. Is a, it, it, you're saying every episode is going to have a structure more or less like the pilot. So if you did a, a medical show and you met everybody in the hospital and and there's cases of the week and that's the show every week. Um, but then a premise pilot would be, OK, this is the premise of the series. These are the characters. These are some of the challenges they're going to face. And now by the end of the pilot, we're intrigued and we want to know more about them and see the adventures they're going to go on. But I don't. I couldn't tell you what the structure of episode two or three or four would be. Um, right. And obviously, premise pilots or premise shows right now are huge uh, because it's it's kind of a more natural storytelling. But I was just watching a medical show last night, and I found it so relaxing to watch <laughs> and know know that I was re watching an old. House MD last night, wow. and it was just so comfortable to know. Okay, he's going to get it wrong for three or four acts, almost kill the patient, and then at the end he's going to figure it out. And in the, along the way, he's going to figure out something about out about himself or someone that he's friends with, and they'll mirror each other. And that that structure was so relaxing, <laughs> and I enjoyed it. And I watched two of them, um, but uh, but that's where the premise pilot is. So the question about tone is huge for the for the how we're going to figure out this show, right? Yeah, well, that's where I feel like the your showrunner there, hopefully they bring to the table what they want the tone to be so mm -hmm. that you know when you hit the ground on day one what you need to be working towards. Mm -hmm. But which is not to say that that can't change or evolve right. through everyone being in the room. But I don't know. What do you guys think? I think the, the hardest thing for, for me in the last, and I think it's for Jim too, maybe you speak to it, Jim, but the last few years on shows, like five years, there's, everything has been so intense and that we try to write humor and it never lives because yeah. it's all about what's the, what's the, what are the stakes? What's the thrilling element? What's going to happen next? And that by the time it goes through drafts, the humor gets kind of, kind of pushed out because it's not built into the character. So, right. so it's, you can't have someone, you know, being, holy crap, this sucks. And here's a funny thing 
comment on this incredibly exciting thing that's happening on screen because that's not who the character is. So it's not, it's just going to get cut too easily. And it happened, and it just squeezed mm-hmm. out. And I end up writing, you know, we end up writing very thrillery, intense, fun, but fun in that intense way, not fun in the, not in, like in the Doom Patrol way, which has both, I think. Right. Yeah, because it gets deemed like non essential. Right. If, right. Uh, you're always like pressed to cut time on TV. And so anything, especially jokes, you know, first to go. First to go. And I also think it's like the easiest thing for um, executives to say which is they are looking for yeah. what's pushing the story, what's right. pushing the story, what's pushing the story. If it's not baked into the characters that they, they always make jokes when they walk into a crime scene together, then you're never going to see it. Yeah, and and I think... I, right. And, and they're not, they may not be wrong in the sense that it's got to come out of character, but also that, you know, trimming everything to the bone, then it becomes very plotty. And I think that can get... that can And that's what we are always... I find that we're always struggling with that. Does that happen with you? Um, no, because I mean, you're a not, much better writer. <laughs> no, <laughs> Just no, say no. it to her. It's okay. Just say it. No, I'm not even close. Um, but I, I'm just thinking about on Doom Patrol, just everything that my personal taste is just to infuse everything with humor because I can't be serious for two seconds and I, you know, uh, feelings frighten me. Mm-hmm. So to just like <laughs> sprinkle sugar onto everything. Um, yeah. So I think because it's already ingrained in everything I try to write. But yeah, I mean, there's always, yeah, there's always stuff that you feel like, because for me, like a lot of times when I'm writing, I'm just trying to entertain myself. And right. then, you know, like you come up with a great joke that you think is so clever and funny and you walk around your house, you know, laughing to yourself because you've been so <laughs> clever and funny. And then you come back and you realize like, but this character wouldn't, that's not really their voice or like it's too glib for the moment, yeah. you know, and then you have to kill it. Yeah, I know. You know, I feel like I, uh, that is so true. And there, I, I feel like, I, you know how in life in general, we're always trying to say, let's appreciate this moment with our kid or with our dad or with the son or we're on the beach. And there's those moments where you're like, just enjoy it because life doesn't get better than this. And I feel like with writing, there's that <laughs> moment, right? Where maybe Jim and I are writing something and we make each other laugh or we're like, oh my God, that's so good. Holy crap. That's huh. it, man. And then I think, just hold on to this moment. Right. <laughs> just <hold on. laughs> we won't have it again this week. It won't. This- <laughs> This will never go anywhere, this particular thing. It'll never make it to the next draft, but God bless yeah. it. It's so beautiful. Uh, I came out. I came up um, to, to my uh, wife after a day of writing, and I was like, and I said, this is the best writing I've ever done, right? I really felt that way about what we had done wow. that day. And, uh, and it, it lasted 36 hours, maybe, until it was completely <laughs> <laughs> taken apart for any number of reasons. And that is, that's that's the life, right? You know what I used to do um, is after a day of being isolated and just writing at the computer, I would go into the bedroom where my wife would be watching TV or something, and I'd throw my, myself on the bed, and I would just say, my job is so hard. You can never do my job. <laughs> you would You would die if you had to do my job. I love being uh, dramatic. Uh, it's hard to get it's hard that, but it, it is hard to explain to people though that how crushing it is when you're you know it's killing the babies it's just one after the other after the other so I think it helps to have a writing partner actually for that reason which is you can both enjoy that baby for a minute or for a day or a draft before you throw it onto a spike <laughs> that's right before somebody <laughs> says right. um you know, I don't, I don't, I think, well, I think that's got to go. And then by that point, by the way, you've had 85 babies since then. You're like, ah, fuck it. Whatever. Move, let's move stupid on. kid. Stupid yeah. kid. Yeah. Um, well, that's what someone sort of explained to me early on when I, I asked them like, wow, is it hard to, you know, I know you had to cut this joke or whatever, and it was so good. And did you feel bad about that? And they explained to me because they had been working for decades and they said, no, because I'll find another use for it. Oh yeah, that's, that's true too. That's, in some other way. that's the lie we tell each other. <laughs> tell ourselves, <laughs> I should say. <laughs> That'll come around. First of all, I'll never remember it. Uh, every now and again, Jim and I'll be like, "Remember that thing?" And then we we try to we steal from ourselves as often as we possibly can. Um, oh, for sure. Now, when we were breaking the story, I think it's interesting. We broke the dude, but we didn't talk about his wife, who's dealing with all this, or his fiance, right? We talked about the uncle. Yeah. We talked. We got two men. So let's and 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 you know, this is something that. 
we have to be careful about, not just the gender balance, but also to flesh out the world. So what role could, what, who's the, who were the other characters in this show? If it's just him, uh, it, that they're getting the book, who else is, I mean, what's, you know, for example, his fiance, do they get married? Does she make the move with him? And if she does, does it work? Like for ex- when we moved out to California, Jim and I moved out with our wives and they flourished and we sat there and wrote script after pointless script. In, uh, and, and, and it was exactly the opposite of the dream that we were hoping for. <laughs> we were li- living off of their salaries, and they did great, which was um, we're thrilled about that. Let's pick up our lives and move someplace else so you can be more successful at your job, honey. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that, was, that was a great – it would have been great if we both nailed it, but we didn't. Thank God they did so we could sponge off of them for a few years. Right. But. But um, but what's what's the wife saying? Does she become more successful as a result of this? I'd hate for her to just lo- him to just lose her. It'd be the unexpected thing, right? Yeah. If she's if he's like, I, I got to go do this thing, and she's like, Good, get me out of here. <laughs> 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 I've always hated this fucking place. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's kind of like the the interesting thing is that he either brings her along, or then she sort of you know feels like her fate is being controlled by by him because it, she's basing major life decisions on this book that he got. And so she's willing to follow that for a minute, but then, you know, the tables could get turned where she actually winds up thriving and he doesn't, Oh, yeah. you know, yeah. or she finds yeah. out stuff about herself that, um, you know, that she didn't have access to where she was living before and that she sort of like, you know, outgrows him or grows away from him, you know, for, for a while. And sort of becomes more of an actualized person than she was than when she would have just stayed back in North Dakota with uh, dry, cracked hands and been a, a farmer <laughs> and a wife. Right. Um, yeah. Oh, but then eventually, you know, like I kind of now want them to get back together at the end, to come back around. Well, and the thing is, it's not a movie, so they can, you know, these problems that come up, we can milk them for an episode or two. Right. And, oh, yeah. And we're seeing here, you know, she comes out and she's miserable. Right. It's it doesn't work. And then uh, and their marriage starts to suffer because she's miserable and she's got nothing to do. And she and then things start to happen for her right. and she's happy. And the marriage is now working great. But uh, and then she gets so successful that it now she, there she's miserable again because it's not working for him or whatever it is is the problem. So we're just constantly creating, they're just out of sync and we're trying to create problems. So now the show is not just about the, a dude who gets a book. It's about a, a couple that get a book in a way. Yeah. Right. You it, know what show I think did this like pretty well was um, Halt and Catch Fire. Oh, I didn't see that. You know, I, I, yeah, I haven't watched it. Yeah. It's Jay, great. I mean, it's definitely, it's worth your time. Um, the, uh, but how did they do it that, how did they do it? And what do they do right with that? So, well, it started out with this, um, I can't remember the, the name of the actor, but there's a husband and, he, and I'm, it's been a few years since I watched it. So I'm mm-hmm. going to completely butcher the details, but, uh, you know, check it out and, and see the real story um, where he's starting this computer company. And yeah. it's at the beginning of people, com- be, you know, starting computer companies and stuff before Mac and Apple. And so the family has to make a lot of sacrifices for him to realize this dream. And the, the wife is just sort of there supporting him. And then, but as time goes on, you know, it, it's sort of giving equal weight to both sides of the issue. Hmm. And as time goes on, she actually, uh, you know, is, is working with him and helping him and she's brilliant in her own right. And hmm. so at a certain point, she breaks off from him and starts her own computer company. And that's at the time when it was it was awkward uh, because oh, yeah. because oh my god my wife is being successful how do I live with that right late seventies yeah, yeah. I'm emasculated right and this is the sixties so I imagine that would be you know even more oh, so yeah right yeah so but this is also like I love the the time period of the late sixties or like mm-hmm. the early seventies because that's when women were seeing more equality in the workplace mm-hmm. and there was the pill you know and right. so it's just like sort of being able to have control over your reproductive uh, life opened up a lot of avenues for women, a lot of freedom for women. So it's like a great time to, or a time period to tell a story of a woman who's sort of, you know, seeking more for herself. Now, a hundred percent. And that's how, and I think that's a good way that, you know, we're approaching the characters and we're talking about the characters. So let me, 
there's one thing we haven't talked about, which is the tableau, which is this world of rockets. <laughs> we, we, the whole time, it's oh, interesting. Yeah. And by the way, that's what I think is cool because if if this go back twenty years and this is the beginning for J- me and Jim, we would have talked about rockets for two days. And now mm. it hasn't even come <laughs> up in the conversation because <laughs> it's not about rockets. <laughs> right. It, right. It's never about rockets, but that is the tableau. And, that's the world. And, and and to that point, I was thinking about you. Know, you, you tell a period story to say something about now. Right. Like, what are we saying? I, I liked what you were saying to her about how it's this couple now. Right. Or like this couple gets a book in a way. So we're sort of inviting. There are two people who are leaving a conventional past behind and reaching for some different future together that's unknown and unexplored. And it's mysteries and the uncle and rockets mm-hmm. and all that stuff. Is there any is there anything about setting it in the 60s that talks about now that informs the rest of this hmm. like how we're thinking about the characters and what they should be doing and and what does it mean to be called to be a rocket scientist in 1960 or whenever this is set exactly you know like it, it, kennedy had just said we're going to the moon in a decade right mm-hmm. like there's is it climate change is there some there's something that's you know some giant problem or opportunity that's beckoning that is winds up sucking them both in i don't you, know you just broke my head but huh. Tamara, if you, I got well, something. Keith, Do you have something, Tamara? Yeah. yeah well, we, I, my, just my initial thought, which was that, uh, but I think Jim's is much more interesting. Uh, mine was just the immediate of maybe it keeps them out of the Vietnam War because if you went to school, oh. you didn't have to go. Interesting. Yeah, hike. sure. That's his. That's the real reason why he started this. That's why the yeah, uncle maybe. sent him the book. Yeah. yeah. That's but I interesting. feel like Jim's. It has more legs to it, I guess. Mine is just sort of an immediate. I think it's both and. Well, war, you, but, yeah, you could yeah. do both. I guess well, the, yeah. the thing that, that appeals for this for right now, for me, and, you know, and I just want to say that we always come at it with what we're thinking anyway, and then we bring it to the story. So my thing that I'm bringing out is my recent loss of faith, dissolution of my faith in America, right? This whole mm. election watching four years of Trump that has that re- and watching people support him in spite of all the stuff he's done. And I, I, lo- I, I lost a little faith. I was like, really, you know, we may have right and left side, you know, left wing and right wing. We all come at things differently, but really that stuff's okay with you. And that stuff's okay with you. And I'm starting to lose faith. And I wonder if this, you know, bright eyed kid from North Dakota who loves cracked hands, hates vegetables and loves long johns. Um, <laughs> is now uh you know really like but he's he's true blue you know he's red right and blue and now he gets this thing and now he's going to go rockets and it's about getting a man on the moon and he's very gonna patriotic go patriotic and yeah. now the uncle stuff starts creeping up and those are turns i mean big twist for him because and he starts losing he's like what do i believe in because I, i'm asking the same oh. question what do i believe in you know do i and some days i'm like i believe in the same thing that 78 million people believed in in this last election and then i the other days i wake up and i think but i don't believe in what 70 million people <laughs> did believe in right. and i think how do i reconcile that and 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 maybe i can maybe i can, maybe that's a theme that we can find or maybe i'm just stuffing it th- into that into no, that whole show <clears throat> i think those conflicts are are built in i think that's an interesting lens to put it through right mm-hmm. the the country was beginning to break apart into two different directions mm-hmm. based on on the women's the nascent women's movement and civil rights and all of these other things they're making people choose what part of of america they loved most is it white people in charge or is it equality under the law like yeah what do you like best how did this how did we get here this was such a nice story about a book <laughs> Cool. I know. <laughs> and literally, I started like, oh, October Sky. I love yeah. that movie. It's the first thing I thought of. Yeah, that was they... a great movie. Well, we'll do all this other stuff as subtext. <laughs> well, oh, excellent. Well, here's the beautiful thing about it. We get to come up with all that stuff, and then we don't have to write it. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> we don't have to put it up a, on a screen and think, oh, my God, those ideas that we were talking about were so good, and this is so bad. This draft is <laughs> shit, right? That moment, because talk about your low is is when you have a conception for a scene or a, or even a whole script, and then you read it, and you're like, "Mother God, how did this happen? Why? How did this happen?" And then you get to work, and you start 
rewriting and rewriting and peeling it back and making it better and better. And, you know, by episode, by, by draft seven, maybe you got something that looks good. So yeah, it's like cleaning out your garage in a, in a way. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. I'm going to steal yeah. that. Yeah. Let's clean out the garage. Or, or burning down your garage. <laughs> yeah, or just burning it down. Also. <laughs> and on, on that note, uh, Tamara, thank you so much for coming on and doing this with us. This is awesome. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you. I was thrilled to be asked. And, and now you can go to make, it, make it October Sky, and it'll be much better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm totally stealing this idea. It's your idea. PM, PM. <laughs> All right, thank All right, you. Thank Bye. you, Tamara. And that's all we've got for you this week. Our producer, J.R. Zamora Thal, is working the mixing board. Our logo was designed by Julian DeBar Montclair, and our music was provided by Buddha Rays out of Austin, Texas. If you want to get in touch, we are at The Salmon Gym on Instagram and Twitter. And you can find us on Facebook and YouTube as The Writer's Room at Salmon Gym. And if you like hanging out in the room with us, give us a follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And tell a friend, would you, so we can get JR paid. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. <laughs>